This is heavy. Grab one of those carts. Except I don't know how you're going to get it over the wires. It's nice to have more people show up than we have chairs for. So, <clears throat> so how many brand new people? Brand new. Okay. Should I should I qualify that a little bit? How many people have never seen a, a seminar? Or online, okay, just a few. All right, that's good though. People came from all over to the small town of Canadian, Texas. <laughs> to meet a terrorist, <laughs> or so the local paper said. <laughs> that's funny. We're not any government. We're any corrupt government. There's a big difference. They don't even know the difference between a state national and a citizen. This year is changing things a lot. We, we started out the year January 1st with just a little under 2 million people. And now we're over 10. And that's just the ones that have done their paperwork. I'm told there's more than 50 million people in the United States who know, are learning, and are in the process. 50 million. There's a, over 100 million people worldwide watching what we're doing. I'm getting as many as a dozen requests a week to do seminars in other countries. It's just amazing to me. It's humbling to me to see the, uh, the world waking up as it is. Largest television station in Germany said that we're making a critical difference in all of Eastern Europe and Germany. A critical difference. David. Hold on a minute. Sorry to interrupt you. No, we're not ready for no. prayer yet. No, it's not prayer time yet. We're close. Um, there's actually three vehicles that are blocking the road. That there's a truck trying to get out or through. So yep. it's a, a silver truck and oh. two black ones. I'm sorry. I mean, you know. You got a license plate number or I know, something? No, right? No. Um, <laughs> it was a woman that saw the situation and she didn't get the license plate. I'm not going to throw her under the bus. I know a guy. Well, you go find out which cars would, and then come back up here. <laughs> a guy would have gotten the license plate. It's okay. So if you know that your truck. Two black ones, one silver one are kind of out there and blocking traffic. You're talking about the little gravel road where the food trucks were going to pull in? You no, know, I haven't seen myself, okay. but I just wanted to put everybody on notice. If you <clears> think <throat> it might be your truck, we can move it, and that would be great. I'll find out more information and get back with you. Good plan. <laughs> Men would identify things a little better. Just saying. Um, <laughs> oh, this, where was I? Threw me all off. Uh, <laughs> yeah, going around the world. I got, I've gotten calls from Russia. Groups of more than 2,500 people in a group that wants us to come speak. I want to focus on the United States of America. K-12 
Canada has been bugging me for a year and a half. Ever since COVID, I quit doing seminars in Canada. I used to do them up there. And people don't know this, but Canada is part of the United States. And it has been for a very, very long time. In fact, it's been part of the United States since this document was written, the Articles of Confederation. Okay. People don't understand the four pillars of the world and that Washington, D.C. is the fourth pillar, the military arm of the world. And they don't understand what that controls. They don't understand our federal districts and how Canada and Mexico are actually four federal districts of the District of Columbia. People don't bother to trace corporations and their hierarchy and where their shareholders are from and who those shareholders are and how they get paid. And they don't, they don't trace the money. And the money, all following the money always tells us who is who and what is what. And that's been a problem in the United States is how much has been kept hidden. Well, we're done hiding stuff. I'm for full and honest disclosure and nothing, nothing less. I understand for security reasons, some things have to be hidden. But I wanted to let you all know that we're going to try and get as much information as we can in a very short period of time out to the people and let this nation awaken. And I think when we do, it's going to change everything. I know it is. I know it already is changing everything. We don't want to start without prayer. It no, sounds like you're already starting. No, I'm not starting yet. <laughs> we got housekeeping things to do. We got introductions to do before we get started. So, <clears throat> this seminar is kind of special to me. And I knew it from the very first moment. Not only would we get a lot of people from a lot of different areas, but we're in a very small town out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, the closest big city is three hours away. And I like small towns. I grew up in small towns. My whole high school had less population than this town. Um, my graduating class was 22 people tell you where I came from. I'm a farm boy from a mill town in Oregon. That's, that's where I came from. And uh, I love this country. I love this country more than anything. And I love its people. I love each and every one of you and I want to thank you for coming from as far away as you did. We got people from Florida, we got people from the East Coast, we got people from Hawaii, California, in the room. That's a long way to come. Yeah, yeah, many great states are represented here today. And a lot of people from Texas. Yeah! <laughs> so. And by the way, David lives in Texas now. Yay! <laughs> No idea what brought me there. <laughs> anyway. This little Texas country girl. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, we've got food in the back. We've got three food carts showing up. They're trying to get all set up across the street. Uh, so you really don't have to go anywhere for lunch other than right here in the parking lot. And then you can bring... Bring your food in and eat it at the tables. Um, or you'll get some potty breaks. 
We'll do potty breaks and lunch breaks, but we're going to go all day for three days. During that period of time, I'm going to try and answer as much, most of your questions up here. I, if I haven't answered them in the videos already. <laughs> it's really hard for David to um, be speaking because he, he has, you know, he doesn't operate on a script. He's got his uh, system in his head on, on what, what information to impart and when to impart it. A lot of times if people ask questions, it turns into 30 additional questions and then he gets lost on where was I? So if, if you would, if you have a question, when he talks about a topic, write down your question, bring them to me, and we will make sure that by the end of the seminar, your questions get answered. Or as many of them as we because can. Because it is anyway. likely that <clears throat> as he imparts information, that question will be answered as he continues. He'll cover it sometime within the three days of him speaking. So please just write them down. Because otherwise, it turns a little tangled, and then it gets lost and off track. So it makes it so much easier if you just write the questions down as they come up in your mind. Because chances are, by the end of the seminar, you'll be able to strike them off the list. Oh, yeah, David covered that. Just draw a line through it. Right. We've got a lot of great support people here. we got Bobby Lawrence in the house. Yay, Bobby! So nice to have Bobby here. Rob. We got Neil. Rob and Neil. Our sound and video guys. We could not do this without them. They are pivotal. And we have how many people online, Rob? 80? 136. 136 people online. Okay. And there's 250 in this room. Is that about right? 250? Wow. So 380. Oh, she's got the license plates of the people that, oh, thank you, dear. Awesome. Okay, so we have a black Silverado license. The number is 214KBC and then a gray Challenger. If you think that might be yours, black Silverado license tag number 214KBC and a gray Challenger. All right. Thank you, guys. We also have some other people to introduce. You know, once the food trucks go in, you could probably park right back where you were. So that might help. Just give them room to get in. Start at the far end with the T-shirts. I can't even see that far back. <laughs> we got our wonderful Katie back there with T-shirts. Yay, Katie. <laughs> Kate, Katie is uh, absolutely incredible. She's got four of the most beautiful little children you ever saw in your life. And uh, we helped stop CPS from taking them twice. Yes, twice. <clears throat> Many of you might have seen that video of me spanking back that att the CPS attorney. Remember that? I made a whole video. It's based on her situation. <laughs> Quit throwing me off. Sorry. We got we, we got Cordy and Tony with the MCOs. Yay! As I talk about traffic and driving and stuff, I'm going to have them come up for a bit, and uh, they got some things to cover that are going to be very cool. We got Marcella Crandall at 7K Medals. Yay! Marcella, wave to everybody <laughs> so they can see you. Marcella and I go way back. And uh, everyone was asking me where to buy gold and silver. And we found 7K, Marcella did, got me involved in 7K. And the more I learned about that company, the more impressed I was. And uh, there's various ways to sign up. There's ways to augment your income. There's uh, ways to do small silver investment savings programs. 
They're coming out with their a credit card. There's people rolling their entire 401ks into 7K metal and putting them in gold and silver, which is cool because that's untaxable. Then we have Glenn Fern, huh. who is a co-author of the book that we'll be selling at my table. Let me and hold it up. He, he co-authored the book, Trump, Is He a Patriot or Not? Um, I will be here at the corner of the table. I've got some books for sale. Um, one of them is written by the vice president of the Republic of Texas. His name is Mike Blackwell. He wrote a book called... Fraud, treason by fraud, lies, and deceit. And he was a Vietnam War vet and not an author. He was actually a real estate developer, very successful in Denton, Texas. And God had impressed him to write this book about the fraud with that all capital name. You know, the one that's on our birth certificate, our driver's license, and all that good stuff. Well, he wrote a whole book about it that goes hand in hand with everything that David teaches. And, and Glenn's here today, and he'll yep, he autograph this for you if you want. He, he co-authored, Glenn Fern did, co-authored with Mike Blackwell, the same guy that wrote The Trees and By Fraud, Lies, and Deceit, and this book, my personal favorite. This book is so packed full of truth that it is outlawed in Europe. That tells you something right there. It's a very spiritual book written by a woman author who is the most translated author in the world into more languages than any other author. She died in 1917, was born in 1833, and she had a, a gift that God gave her to write about things that she knew nothing about. God just imparted to her what to write. She wrote about the very times we're living in today and the very exact details of things that will happen to God's people right before the return of our Savior, why do you think they don't want you to read it in Europe? There are things, and she unlocks a lot of the mysteries of revelations in this book and shows you how to unlock those, those pieces to the puzzle and make it so simple, but she, she's a, an amazing author, and this is a very deep spiritual book. It's interesting, this author is also recognized by the Illuminati. They tell all their people to read every book she wrote so that they can counteract this righteous woman and everything she tells God's people to do. So they recognize her as a true, legitimate Prophet. Her the name, Great Controversy. Her name is uh, Ellen White, and the, the book is The Great Controversy, and it is a very well-known book, and I promise you it is rich. It is very, very spiritual book. <clears throat> One of my favorites. Um, shall we? No, I haven't it? done yet. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Patience, girl. Dr. Buzz. With a cowboy Raise hat Raise your hand. Like one of, one of the things we all need the most is good health. Good health and energy, calmness in the face of danger. We need our stress reduced. How many people have high stress? How many people are feeling any high stress right now in this room? There's a reason why. You're not. There's technology going right now in this room that's affecting each and every one of you. In a good way. In a good way. And you're going to feel it. And you're going to sit through it for three days. And you're going to see, Benefit see the benefits and the differences. And uh, we're going to have have a little demonstration up here uh, for you on the technology that's involved. And it's pretty cool stuff. You're going <laughs> to like it. You're going to like it. All right, go ahead. Is it time? Go ahead. Is it time? We want to pray, right? We want to petition our Heavenly Father for a blessing. 
You know, he tells us in his word that when we ask, that we shall receive. And many times we don't receive the blessings because we don't ask for them. Well, we don't want to fall short on that today. We want to ask for a blessing because we all need it every day, all day long. So if you would, please bow your heads with me as we petition our Father for a blessing. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your love and your mercy and your goodness and your constant protection. Dear Lord, we love you so much. We just pray and petition um, the heavenly courts above that you would send your holy angels to be stationed around each and every soul that is here in this place. And not only this place, but in all of Canadian Texas. And not only Canadian, but every single city in Texas, every nation state in this union of states. Dear Lord, <clears throat> your people need you. And we don't have any bargaining chip to negotiate with with you other than our need is so great. You see the people in this room and how many of them are here because they've had injuries, um, injuries, trespasses on their rights. Dear Lord, we know that the enemy is roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. We pray that you stop the enemy in his tracks. You station your angels around each and every one of us, not only this weekend, but as we go home to our nation states, that you would bless these same people, protect them in their travels as they return home, help them to arrive safely, and help them to be a bright light shining in their nation state for you. Dear Lord, this is your movement. You are the creator of every human. Every life is precious to you. You designed us all. In our mother's womb, you wove our bones and flesh together. You picked our eye color, our hair color, and every detail of our life. We praise you for that because you are the master creator, and we are masterpieces of your creation. We just pour out our hearts to you and ask that you look at our pain and you see our need and that you fill us and that you bless us. Dear Lord, we need you desperately. We pray for your Holy Spirit to be poured out on our nation. You tell us in your word. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Dear Lord, we need a healing. We have been raped and plundered in this economic system that has been set up for hundreds of years. We need your blessing desperately. I lift up David to you and pray for a blessing over his feet and his legs and his back and his shoulders and his neck and his mind and his mouth, that you would use every cell in his body to glorify you and that you would speak through him from your throne room on high, dear Lord, that he would be your messenger. Dear Lord, that you, we are so blessed that you would pick humble vessels like David and I to do your work. We're so blessed and we're so thankful I pray, dear Lord, for a blessing and an anointing upon him from on high this day. Dear Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, we glorify your name. Your will be done, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In Yahshua's name I pray, amen. Amen. It's always hard for me to start after that. <clears throat> I, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that are going on in the country right now and just open up with that and let you know that there are, there are people out there, they're disinformation people. And many, many, many good patriots watch them and fall into their traps. Many of them wear the Illuminati ring. For a long period of time, they hide their face. Or they're very, they haven't been around very long. They, some of them are new to the patriot movement. They've been studying for about 
two, three years maybe. And that's given them a lot of credit because I don't think they study very much. And I see them out there getting people in trouble. And that hurts me. It makes me mad. One thing you're going to find with us, with this state national movement with me, is I'm not going to teach anything, anything that's not tried, proven, and provable. I'm not going to, you're not going to find me teaching stuff that's in the sovereign, F, the FBI sovereign citizens manual for police officers. I don't teach that stuff. And there's a lot of practices that other groups out there are teaching that come right out of that manual. And they're absolutely illegal processes. Now, do they work? Yes, they do sometimes. In fact, government allows them to work. Well, for a little while anyway. And then they come after you for that. There's a reason they do that. It's profit for them. It's very profitable to allow it to happen. We're going to talk a lot about the Internal Revenue Service this weekend and about their process and who they are and what their intent it was and what they do. And we're going to talk about that. Am I an anti-tax guy? No, I'm really not. I believe we agreed to pay for certain things. Things that we can't provide for ourselves, like a good national defense. We agreed to pay for that. And those that agreement said we're, we were going to pay for that in a certain way. And I'm all for that. I don't like potholes in my roads either. But I'm smart enough to know that the tax comes at the pump. When you put gas and fuel in your vehicle, gas and diesel in your vehicle, you pay a tax. And that's a fair tax. And that's what paves the roads. And we should pay those taxes. But there's other taxes that aren't fair. In fact, they're unlawful tax. An unlawful tax. And we pay those every day. And we're going to talk about the differences and what those are. The biggest re reason I want to talk about the IRS a little bit more today is because some of the process of people you're using, they shouldn't be using. And when I talk about it, you're going to see why. Because I was taught to always look at the history and the origin of something. What created that agency? Where did it come from? How was it created? What is it? Who is it supposed to be for? What's it supposed to do? And when I teach you that, then those processes don't make sense. They won't make sense. And you'll understand why I don't teach those processes. I love my people. I love the people of America more than anything. Every one of you are my brothers and sisters. And I don't want anyone in trouble. No one. But I do want us standing up against corruption. We need to hold them accountable. And something pretty cool that's been happening for this year, for the most part, 
is how many judges, lawyers, police officers, chief of police, politicians are coming to our seminars? How many federal employees, IRS agents? I put on a seminar in Utah right across the street in Ogden from the IRS. We had 100 plus people parking in their parking lot. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. I could look, stand up here and I could look out the windows and see their building. And there it was. And we had people in the room who worked there. And it was a great thing. A great thing. How many federal employees do we have in here? Don't be shy, just raise your hand. We're not against you. Believe me, I wish lots of federal employees had come from all different departments. How many from our judicial system, judges, attorneys, anybody? Man, I had one of the greatest experiences at the last seminar with an attorney she sat right up front. I, it was just wonderful. Wonderful. Her husband's an attorney too, and he wouldn't come. And boy, she loved every minute of it. I, I love that woman. She, she is fabulous, and she's out now helping the people. That's what she does now. Completely changed. Good, good person. Who's going to be a good people really soon? Everybody understand what I just said? Yeah. I found it cool. A few rallies ago, President Trump stood up and said that Ivanka and Don Jr. were good persons, but Eric was a good people. <laughs> yeah, he was talking about his own family. That was pretty cool, wasn't it, Bobby? <laughs> How many politicians we have in the room? All right, not a one? You're not raising your hand very high. <laughs> uh, I knew she was here and I was looking for her. Where is she? She didn't want to raise her hand, but that's okay, we love her. She is awesome. We need them here. We need them to learn what I'm teaching. A couple of seminars ago, I had a border patrol agent and his wife, and his wife worked for, well, she did stuff with uh, CPS. And Sunday at lunchtime at the seminar, she quit her job. And the border patrol agent within a week, all of his guys that he's in charge of, him and his family went and recorded all their freedom bundles. And they're all state nationals now. But for over three months before that meeting, they were spending all day, every day, cruising the border in their pickup, government pickup trucks, listening to me on the radio. We've had uh, law enforcement, our policy officers, a lot of them come to our seminars lately. Do we have any law enforcement in the room? We had a, we had a Texas Ranger stop by yesterday while we were setting up, came in and talked to us. Super nice guy. I hope he comes this weekend. We've invited him here. He's a really, really good man. And he's been watching my videos. You know, this is an important. We're having police chiefs call us to come teach their officers now. 
That's incredible, incredibly important. Atlanta, Georgia, the police chief of Atlanta, Georgia, fifth largest police force in the United States, wants Bobby to come teach the difference to all those officers, the difference between an American state national and a sovereign citizen and what they're taught by the FBI. That's incredible to me. We're seeing changes all over. People who drive fast like me and Gwen. Gwen got stopped the other day. You met Gwen? Everybody met Gwen? Raise your hand, Gwen. Her videos of getting out of tickets. Man, she's got it down. Yeah. <laughs> Those kind of things are fun to watch. They're fun to watch her videos. Her mom and dad run a State Nationals Rock website and the TikTok channels. They're all over TikTok with millions of people watching them. And uh, yeah, Gwen's wearing a State Nationals Rock t shirt saying, I do not consent. There's so many great people around the country in this movement that are standing up and doing something. There's so many good websites. There's over a hundred plus telegram channels dedicated to it, to everything you can think of, to land patents, to MCOs, to traveling by right. Lots and lots of help out there. Stuff that I read 25, 30 years ago that I teach, but I can't remember where I read it, what document it came out of, things like that. Man, we just put those little things on the Telegram channel and 44,000 people go to work researching and they end up finding it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And they find it and they post it on Telegram. Within minutes, those guys are good. Nothing better for teachers than to see our students better than us, huh? That's right. Yeah, we do. We learn from you guys every day. I'm still learning. Always will be. I'll never stop. We just keep learning more and more and more. I want you to understand that. Last week on Wednesday, I was on a... Uh, on a phone call with a young man walking into court where he was being charged with six felonies. Six felonies. And he's going into a jury trial and things had not gone well for him up to that point. And he was getting my advice and counsel on what to say. And he did everything I told him to do the way I told him to do it. We'd been practicing for two days. And as he was going into the court, he was getting that final strength that I was giving him. And he stood up in that courtroom and he did exactly what he was supposed to do, and all six felony charges were dropped, and he walked out free. Yeah. It's always early, easier in the early stages. The longer somebody's been involved with the courts, the harder things get, right? But that was just one of at least three wins that I know about last week. We're constantly hammering them nationwide in our court systems. And we're winning. And we're winning over and over and over again. Now, does everybody get it right? 
No. No, they don't. A lot of times they'll get in there and they'll they'll mess up or the pressure is too great or they can't think fast enough on their feet and things go wrong. And they they come out on the wrong side of the law. And that's difficult and I don't like to see it, but it happens and it happens every day. All we can do is do our best. We can be the best quarterbacks on the field, but we never know which way the receiver is going to run. We don't know if he's a first game freshman receiver. We don't know if he even knows which way to run or how to avoid a tackle. All we can do is get to be the best we can where we're that perfect quarterback and we throw that perfect spiral down to the end of the field and it lands in exactly the right place at exactly the right time in the right person's hands. But we can't control the receiver. And that's where state nationals lose sometimes. I mean, you get things into the hands of some of these liberals and they don't know what the hell to do with them. And that's a problem. And that's why we win and we lose. But one thing we got to do, one thing we have to do, we absolutely must not quit. We don't quit. I've been trying to wake up America for 35 years. more than three decades. And it was going along like this for a while. And nothing was happening. And then I started to see it go up. And it started to increase. And now it's like a rocket ship. It's just taken off. And I could walk away today and this forest fire that we started is not going to be put out. just not. No matter how many naysayers are out there, no matter how much they try and discredit you, no matter how much they say we're terrorists, geez, we haven't fired a shot. <laughs> not that we shouldn't be. But our pen is the most powerful weapon we have. And we've got to do everything in our power that we can do peacefully. That's why we fly the civil flag of peace. I was down in Louisiana not too long ago. Can't hardly say that. And somebody gave me a picture. And it was from a little town called Cameroon, Louisiana. And it was a picture right at the very beginning, taken right at the very beginning of the Civil War, where the first young man was issued his very first Civil War uniform, and he was going east to go to war. And he's from the town of Cameroon. And he had his picture taken in his brand new, freshly brand new uniform with his family in front of the government building in Cameroon that had the peace flag flying above it. That was 1859. See, that's pretty cool to me. And I've collected over the years probably 10 or 15 photographs of our government buildings back when they were flying the peace flag. But how many of you, before you got into this movement, had ever seen the civil flag of peace in your lifetime? Very few have ever seen the peace flag. 
If you put the Coast Guard's logo in the middle of it, it's the Coast Guard flag. Because the Coast Guard was started as a civil organization. And they were at peace, not at war. They weren't part of the, the military. Now they are. That's been changed. And they're part of the military. But I'm going to tell you a few things that you didn't know. And things we haven't been teaching for a while because I didn't think people were ready. But I think we're ready now. And there's a lot of things. Before this document, the Declaration of Independence, before this document, there were things that happened in this country. One of the most important documents we have in this country was written on a napkin in pencil. It's called the Lee Resolution. And it was written two days before this was written. And it was the Lee Resolution that declared our freedom. And on that napkin is the actual vote count of how many yeas and how many nays. And it had signatures from a representative of each of the 13 colonies on it. And it was written in pencil on a napkin and sent to England. And it was recorded. And if it wasn't recorded, we wouldn't have a copy today. And I have a copy in my book. And it was two days before this. But what happened even before that? Let's go an entire year before this. The United States Army was created. The Uniform Code of Military Justice was put into place. Yeah, a year before the Declaration. The, the Navy followed just a month or two after. Right after that came the Marines. We won't talk about the Air Force. We weren't flying back then, okay? Air Force was developed out of the Army. But we had the Army, the Navy, and the Marines before we had a country. And this nation was under the UCMJ. And there's a reason I'm going to tell you this right now. Now is the time to start bringing this out. Because the military is in control. And they always have been. But there was an act of Congress called the Posse Comitatus Act that existed so they couldn't get involved in civil matters. But we've always been under the Lieber Code, under martial rule since 1861. Who put that into place? Lincoln. Our first Bar Association president. We had other attorneys as president before. Well, they weren't attorneys. They were lawyers, law sayers. That's where lawyers come from, law sayers. And we had other presidents prior to Lincoln who were law sayers. But Lincoln was the first bar lawyer. You know what the bar stands for, don't you? British Accreditation Registry. We've had treaties over the years. The last one was 1947 that allowed the Bar Association to operate on these shores as foreign agents. Any member of the bar is a foreign agent. They're supposed to register under FARA, the Foreign Agent Registration Act. They rarely do. Rarely do. President Trump wanted to get rid of 
FARA because it costs our government about $5 million a year to run that office. And uh, nobody was registering. Do you understand it's a requirement for them to register, though? What I'm telling you by saying that is that uh, there's certain things that we need to start demanding from our Department of Justice, our courts, our magistrates, and our judges. We need to start demanding their oath of office, a copy of their corporate charter. We need to start asking them for their license to do business in this state or any state that you're in. You will soon quickly find out they have no license to do business in your state. Start asking them for their Foreign Agent Registration Act document. See, there are no judges in a state. Listen to what I just said. There are no judges in a state. There is only magistrates in a state. Operating under administrative rule. administrative rule. If they're magistrates operating under administrative rule and the president who is the chief of the Department of Justice appoints a secretary of the Department of Justice, what branch is the Department of Justice under? Go ahead and say it. The administrative branch of government. That's new information for some of you. I can see that on your faces. The only Article Three courts operating in the United States is the Supreme Court of the United States and the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. because it's been in continuous existence even before the Supreme Court. That's it. What else operates as an Article Three court? We the people's courts. We the people's courts, when we set up our common law juries, now, in order for you to set up a common law jury, you have to have a country that you set it up under. What has President Trump been saying for years in his rally? That this nation is a nation of 50 nation states. He's always saying that. This nation is 50 nation states united for a cause. Yeah, but they're just under the UN treaty. But they're still there. They just operate a little differently because of the UN treaty coming first. Yeah, Alaska and Hawaii is what he said. There's some differences there. A little bit of difference in Louisiana because they adopted the Napoleonic Code as law. And it's also a little different in our Commonwealth states. Our Commonwealth states were republics before they were Commonwealth. And they chose to be Commonwealth states. A Commonwealth is the Commonwealth of England understand that you guys they operate under english law but so do we nothing's different the entire united states operates under english law 
Always has. And where did that descend from? Roman civil law. English law descended from Roman civil law. We've got to understand one important thing. And I start a lot of my seminars, most of them, off with this one important thing. And people ask me all the time, David, how, how do I talk to my family who doesn't believe? Or how do I talk to my friends who don't believe? I like my friends, but they don't believe. And I say, why don't you start off precept upon precept? Don't throw up all over him. <laughs> don't just give him a whole bunch of information. But start off with your first precept of there's two or more of everything. And teach them that. And when they grasp that concept, they'll start to grasp the rest. They'll begin to grasp the rest. When my seminars started to go from more than 20 people in the room, who the next month it was the same 20 people, and then the next month it was the same 20 people, and then all of a sudden new people started to come in is when I was starting to teach there's two or more of everything. That's when things started to grow because people could get that concept. So I'm gonna cover that a little bit today. I have to, it's that important. You've probably heard it a dozen times and for those that have, I'm sorry. But we have the United States of America, this beautiful country of mine, where we all live, it's beautiful from sea to shining sea. I think we have as much or more diversity in this country than any country in the world. We've got beautiful beaches and great plains. And we have swamp. We've got the Grand Canyon, the high deserts, the beautiful snow-capped peaks. We've got so much beautiful farmland. One of the hardest things for me is watching them kill it, poison it from the air and from the water, and watch them kill my nation. And they're doing it. We got people on video road crews that spray the antifreeze de-icer on the roads. Got videos of them pulling up on a bridge and emptying their trucks, what's left in their truck at the end of the shift into the river. It's poison they're dumping into the river. Yesterday, I don't know if you guys got here early enough and took pictures of the sky here, but they hit us with chemtrails so hard yesterday. The amount of chemtrails that were in the sky above this place yesterday was incredible. That's barium and aluminum they're spraying on you. I used to own a big manufacturing company and everything we produced was out of aluminum. And these guys had come in to buy this aluminum and pretty soon I started all of our scrap. And I started asking, well, what do you do with it? And they wouldn't tell me. So one day I got in the truck and I followed them for three hours when they left. They had a whole semi-truck of aluminum scrap they picked up at our shop. And I followed them up to the Portland, Oregon airport where they pulled into a giant hangar and unloaded the scrap aluminum where people were using skid steers and loading that stuff about a quarter yard at a time into a big grinder and it was grinding it into a little tiny flake, little teeny tiny flake of aluminum. 
and they were putting it, loading it on the chemtrail planes. And it floats in the air and it reflects the sunlight and it's supposed to help stop global warming, which that shit's just made up. It doesn't exist, it's SMU. And they mix it with barium. I don't know if you know, but the uh, periodic table of the elements, barium and aluminum, Read that in your Bible. The English they're teaching us to in school is called Babel. You gotta understand what they're doing. This comes a little at a time with your learning, your education process. I can only give you a little bit. I can put some of the pieces together so you start to see the picture, but you gotta study for yourselves. You gotta learn for yourselves. You gotta pray about it. Get on your knees and pray for discernment. And then you'll come to the conclusion that I did. See, what have they been doing to us? Two or more of everything, the United States of America and the United States Corporation. Two different things. In federal code, it tells you the United States is a federal corporation. It's got a Dun & Bradstreet number. It's got the new SAM code. See, they passed a law, they don't have to register with Dun Bradstreet anymore, they can register under SAM. Either way, we'll find them. They can't run, they can't hide. It shows that they're private for-profit corporations. What is the name of your new country? Those that know, don't say anything. It's for the new people. What country do you live in? I'm gonna tell you, it's called the White House Office, Inc. See, President Trump bankrupted the United States Corporation. And Joe Biden got elected and they started it up a brand new company to do business with you. It's called the White House Office, Inc., where Joe R. Biden is the agent of service. And there's 60,000, there's now more than 64,000, and the number went up, I just looked at it again. Every time I look at it, the number goes up. 64,000 subsidiary corporations underneath it. Some of them under Joseph Robinette, and some of them under. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, there's little variations here and there. The White House Office, Inc. Doesn't that make you proud? That's your new c country? <laughs> it's not even located at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. No, that's under the United States of America Corporation where Donald J. Trump is the agent of service at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. That's still listed. Figure that one out for just a minute. I had some friends of mine just get back from Israel about two months ago. They brought me an interesting little photograph. And it was on the Capitol in Jerusalem. And it had our, our American Eagle presidential seal with the Star of David above it. And it said Donald J. Trump is president of Jerusalem. Hmm. Found that pretty interesting. 
You see, people don't even know what he did. What did he do during his presidency? Everybody looked at the list of the things he accomplished. Anybody look at that list? He really is. He really is the king of the world. The king, the, the king of Iran. <laughs> President Trump held the king's sword and stood in front of him. It's never happened in history. He walked across the demilitarized zone in North Korea. He walked in front of the queen and took her emblems down off Westminster. He stood and went inside the forbidden city in China where no other president has gone before. There's been a couple presidents who have seen it from the outside, but he got to see it from the inside. That's right. The only one to ever step foot in there. Putin handed him the soccer ball and said, the ball is in your court, Mr. President. I don't know if you know how important that is. That Putin family goes back in history quite a ways, all the way to King Solomon and King David as one of the 13 royal families. And all 13 of those families are together now. That's important. They're all together. And they're changing things. And your gold back digital certificates are online. They're in the QFS. So I'm going to talk to you about some things that happened in September. September 1st, the royal families told the Vatican to pull all their assets of the world back to the Vatican Bank and to pull it all back. They had, they had deposits in every bank in the world, but they had a lot of real estate and artwork and other things around the world too, things not so easy to move. Not so easy to sell quickly. And they had a lot of that. And they were told to do it and get it done by the 30th of September. They had 30 days to get it done. The 15th of September, the QFS went fully operational. The SWIFT system was shut off. Do you understand what that did? I'll tell you. You don't have to say anything, I'll tell you. 84 to 86 percent, as close as we can tell, of all the World Bank's profits went away on September 15th because they were those profits were made from being traded on the SWIFT system. <clears throat> if you send me $1,000 and you do it at 11 o'clock in the morning from your bank, I might get it at 4 o'clock the next day in mine. That's the way the SWIFT system worked. Let me have you understand this concept really good, quickly. Your banker hit a button. It's electronic. Things travel at 186,000 miles per second in the speed of light in the electronic world. I should have had it right now. But it went into the SWIFT system where they could trade on it every hour throughout that day and night 
around the world, they could make trades on that $1,000 until I got it when someone else in the Swiss system pushed the button at 4 o'clock and it ended up in my account. Milliseconds. And they traded on it all night long. And that multiplied by millions of us sending swift transfers all around the world to people was the majority of banks' profits. That delay. Well, that delay went away. I don't know if anybody has paid a credit card bill recently, but it's kind of fun. I can get my iPad out. I can get my phone out. I can pull up my credit card on both of them. I can pay it from one from my bank account, and the balance reflects right now on my credit card. And the amount available to spend changes just like that in a millisecond now. It used to take two or three days. See, because they used to trade on all that for two or three days on credit card payments. That's all gone now. That's World Bankers' profits, gone. Now, what was the largest, most powerful corporation in the world? The Vatican. That was. It's not anymore. But it was the most powerful, and they had money in banks all over the world, and they allowed the World Bank to trade their money. And they had a deal. Or they share in the profits. And the Vatican had money in not every bank in the world. Well, guess what happened in September? They were told to pull it all back to the Vatican Bank by the 30th. And you know who was in charge of that? The Swiss Prime Minister of Banking. And on the 27th of September, he quit. He resigned his position because he wasn't able to make all those transfers from banks all over the world in 30 days, so he quit. I'll tell you something that else that happened about the 15th of September. As the Vatican started to panic, realizing they weren't going to be able to pull all their assets from all over the world back to the Vatican Bank in time, so they called two friends of mine in the big financial world and said, hey, all those assets we have all over the world, we need you to bond them and sell the bonds so that we can put the cash in the Vatican Bank to protect those assets. And they asked him for $160 trillion bond. And the bond guys, my friends, said, no. There's no country even rich enough to buy $160 trillion worth of bonds. Who are we going to sell them to? <laughs> There's got to be a buyer, <laughs> right? So I'll tell you what happened on the 30th of September. The Vatican lost $160 trillion plus in assets around the world to sovereign nations that absorb those. You know what that did to bankers' profits? That took another big chunk. SWIFT alone was about 84 to 86%. That doesn't leave much. And then the Vatican, what happened with the Vatican was another big chunk of the, what was left. And immediately Bank of America and Goldman Sachs announced bankruptcy. Now they're going to still operate. Don't let that scare you. Well, I know. I know they are. All the banks of the world are still operating. But now where are they making their money? 
walk into any bank branch anywhere in the country, I don't even care what city it is, and you probably won't see more than three employees in there. All the rest of the desks and computers will be empty. First thing they did is cut back personnel. All the banks, they cut back personnel. That's less computers, less desks, less... So they're, they're feeling the pinch right now. I'm telling you this for a reason, because it's how important it is to our world. President Biden wrote an executive order that says anyone with more than $100,000 in the bank or in any deposit box, any amount in any deposit box, if the bank should get into trouble that they can take that money. Well, in September, when things started to go badly for the banking world, they lowered that to 50,000. So if you got more than 50,000 in any one account, in any bank, they can take it. It's their money, not yours. I want you to know that. Be very wary. Get your money out of the banks. Don't have anything more in there than bare minimum operating capital. What you can afford, it's like gambling. Don't go to the casino with more than you can afford to lose. Okay? That's right. See, taking away their power to use the money and make a profit is huge for the banks. Pretty soon there won't be any banks. The royal families are already telling us to start our financial service companies. And they're telling us to do it as a PMA. How many people from this city are within, say, 25, 30 miles? Man, really? You're the only one here. Okay, somebody too scared to raise their hand. I see, all right, a couple more. All right, we're getting about four or five now. You guys, shoot your hands up. Don't be scared. I'm not going to pick on you. The, pa the paper must have some effect here, huh? What the heck? That's crazy. I really was hoping more people, but I'll tell you what I've learned since I've been here in a couple of days. I'm already loving this town. What a cool town. This county is an alcohol-free county. Alcohol-free county. I don't drink anyway. Doesn't matter that much to me one way or the other. Except for the fact that the two places that serve alcohol are private membership associations. Yeah, there's two restaurants in this town that serve alcohol, and you got to show them your ID and become a member. <laughs> and just one person at the table has to show and become a member, and then all of his friends are welcome. That teaches you about PMAs. I've been preaching about PMAs for 20 plus years and how they can't be regulated by government. So in this alcohol-free county, you got two restaurants that are private membership associations that can serve alcohol if they become a member. Isn't that beautiful? I think that's fantastic. Made me love this town right there. Didn't take much, did it? I love my people all over. I really do. Two or more of everything. What's the name of this county? What? 
Hemphill County. That's easy. I had a I had a sheriff's deputy named Hemphill once that was a good friend of mine. I built his barn in his house. Hemphill County. Or is it the county of Hemphill? It's both. One's a private for-profit corporation acting as a governmental services agency. And one is this beautiful land and soil that we have around here. What about the city? What about Canadian? Is it Canadian or is it the city of Canadian? It's both. One of them is just a private for-profit corporation, governmental services corporation. Or should I say it a different way? A private for-profit corporation acting and pretending to be government under the color of law. See, that's what they truly all are, the color of law. The United States Code talks to you about the color of law, teaches you about the color of law, and anything colorable is a fallacy. What, what do you operate under? How about yourself? Who are you? See, that's one of the first things we got to learn. We got to learn who we are. Should I say what we are? See, in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, God gave me man, commanded me to take dominion over the land, the air, and the water, and everything therein. The land, the air, and the water. and everything therein, and subdue it. What does subdue mean in Hebrew? It means to know it, to know it and to understand it, to know it and understand it so well you control it. That's what subdue means. To know it and understand it so well, you control it. And God, the executor, who created all things, he created this entire universe, and he spoke it into existence in one verse. That's why it's called a universe. He spoke it into existence. And when then, when it came time to create man, he got dirty. He got down on his hands and knees and he formed man from the dust of the earth by hand. Every mineral in our body is found below us in the earth itself. Our spinal fluid, our spinal column actually produces AU. Do you know what AU is? Gold. Silver is the closest frequency to the human body. Silver. And that can be found in our bodies. And when we use silver, it can cure disease. It can stop infection. Colloidal silver is an incredible product. It's a natural antibiotic. I even start to feel sick, I just drink colloidal silver. And I don't get sick. See, it's a natural antibiotic. Everything we need is in the earth. Everything. And God created it all. And then he formed man from the minerals of the earth. 
And then he breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, some of your translations will say living being, but it's living soul. So are we really men? And man became a living soul? See, man is the body. It's the land. The soul is who we are. It's our energy. It's our energy field. And that's why technologies like Dr. Buzz's are so important because it controls our energy field. <clears throat> These are the most important things to understand. David Lester Strait, that was a bad, bad shot there. David Lester Strait is not the man. Not written like that. Who is that? That's the vessel. Federal rules of criminal procedure call it the vessel. The vessel. What is a vessel? It's a ship. It's a shipping company. And if you don't own your vessel, and you're not the captain, and you don't control your vessel, you can't tell what port to go in, what cargo to carry, and where it's headed next. So someone else is controlling your vessel if you don't own it. And that is why you're on the citizenship. Mm. Understand that. Understand that. It is your vessel. It's your shipping company. It was registered, given a flag. It was bonded and insured at birth. It was created on a different day than you were born. I was born April 20th, 1963. And my vessel was created on May the 3rd, 1963. That's the date it was registered. How can two things be one and the same? that occurred on a different date. You can't have the 4th of July on the 25th. It can only happen on the 4th, right? This is the vessel. That's the man. That's the man. That's the living soul. My mother gave me one name, my dad gave me the other. My first and my middle name. The other one you can't help. You don't get that choice. That just comes down from family lineage. And I'll tell you what, in my family, when we came on the boats over here, they spelled it all different ways. There's S-P-A-I-G-H-T, there's S-T-A-R-A-I-T, there's E-I-G-H-T, there's E-I-T, which was the original, my last name originally, was that 
Well, my ancestors got off the boat and they get off the dock and they walk down and there's some guy sitting at a table with a pen and a paper and he says, name? And he writes, like and he writes it down. And that's why there's so many different ways to spell straight or street or spate or whatever else it developed into. We can't control our last name. But if you go clear back to the origins in a small little area of Ger I'm going to quit that. Of Germany, it was all spelled like that. All the straights came from there, no matter how it's spelled now. See? Anyway, I'll put these up here where I won't beat them to death. <laughs> so your name is important, and how it's written is important. It's language. I have a treat for you. I hope he's here by Sunday. He's driving all the way down from New York. He's a very famous actor. He's been in lots of movies. And he has a good friend. And his friend is named Daniel. And Daniel is an Oxford PhD prof professor in language, an expert in language. And he's been teaching our actor friend language. And what he taught him to do was take Google Translator and divide the screen into thirds and put Hebrew, Latin, and English in there. And then take something in English, copy and paste it in the English, it automatically translates it into Latin and Hebrew and you will learn that the English language words do not mean what you think they mean. Yes, he did. You remember the name of it? I don't either. I remember the movie. I don't remember the name of the movie. Anyway, Mel Gibson did a movie about that and our language being so important. And this my friends, is how they have dumbed us down. I was really lucky. I was up in New Jersey and I found a couple of books in an antique store and it was the writings of Charles Lamb. And I've read some of Charles Lamb's writings before and I just absolutely love them. He wrote lots of letters to lots of prominent people between about 1760 and 1815. And he wrote lots of letters. And these letters, when compiled together, and you get a chance to read them from Charles Lamb to prominent people, you will see how much of the English language we have lost and the vocabulary. My wife and I sometimes late at night or in the morning, we play a word game to get our brain going, mostly in the mornings. And we just play a word game, just a, two or three games, and we can finish them very quickly. She's, she's pretty smart. But what she realizes how big my vocabulary really is. I'm not just a farm boy from a mill town in Oregon. I've got a big vocabulary. I don't use it that often. I should use it more. But I've studied and read for years and years and years. By the time I was in the second grade, I had read every book in our school library. And I got an award for that, a little plaque. It's hanging on the wall. 
kindergarten, first and second grade, I read every book in the library. By the time I was in sixth grade, I was reading 620 words a minute. By the time I was a freshman in high school, I was in the 900s. My first year in college, I was in the 1600s words a minute. And I used to devour an 800 to 1,000 page book every night. I'm not saying this to brag on myself. I'm telling you that I have read every presidential speech that's ever been written. I've read every act of Congress. I've studied history for 50 years and religion for 50 years and the law for 35. And I don't think there's a law book I haven't read. I've read every state's constitutions, most of every state's state statutes over a long period of time. Do I remember it all? No. And I learned a long time not to read chapter and verse. You'll get more out of it. But I read all of those things to even begin to understand how all these pieces of the puzzle that I teach you goes together. Because they hit it everywhere. They hit it everywhere. I want you to understand what law is. Land, air, and water. The land is common law, common to all mankind. It's property, equity, and rights. It all boils down to who holds superior title. Who holds superior title and who stands on superior rights? It's property rights. You know, all through the Bible, God led his slaves out of captivity. He prepared Moses for 40 years to lead the slaves out of Egypt. And then he said, Go inherit the land. That's what he commanded them to do. For your generations, forever. And we were supposed to do that too. Every piece of property in the United States is under land patent. Something so important that they were signed off by a president, except in Texas. See, Texas is a little different than the rest of the United States. When Texas rejoined the Union, they never ceded their land to the United States, and the rest of the states did. That's why the rest of the states are under the Bureau of Land Management's control. They're the management company. They don't own the property. They're just the managers. And you can get your land patent in all the other states from the Bureau of Land Management, except for some of the 13 original colonies, and most of those are held in Kentucky. Commonwealth of Kentucky. All the Commonwealth states stuff is held in Kentucky. Isn't that interesting? No, that was the museums. That was museums. You see, all property shall be held in land patent. All property shall be described in meets and bounds. All property shall be passed via a grant deed. That's the law. That's the law in all states. So we're going to get into land patents this weekend a little bit. And you're going to see why that's very important. But the land 
is who holds superior title and who stands on superior rights. Do you own yourself? Good. How many people in here have claimed their minor estate? Two. The legal definition of a minor is somebody under the age of 18 or someone of any age who has not claimed their minor estate. So I don't care if you're 96 years old, if you haven't claimed your minor estate, you're still a minor. How do you feel about that? <laughs> Just a big old kid, huh? <laughs> That's right. That's the legal definition. The heir is ecclesiastical or canon law, which is trust law. All things held in a trust. To be a fiduciary for the benefit of another is the highest form of law. Government is supposed to be the beneficiary. I mean the trustee of the people who are the beneficiaries. Government is supposed to be the trustee for the people who are the beneficiaries. Trust law. The water is admiralty or commerce, which is contract law. Contract law. So all law boils down to three things. It's either held in title, held in trust, or held in contract. Which is it? That's how you determine which jurisdiction you're operating in. That's how you determine it. Can everybody in the back hear me? Okay, good. I've got this little buzz somewhere up here. Anyway, uh, land, air, and water. Why is that so important to know? Why did God in Genesis command man to take dominion of the land, the air, and the water, mankind, and subdue it, to take dominion and subdue it? What does take dominion mean? Control. What does subdue? To have the knowledge to have control. That means we've got to know about it. And he commanded us to do that. He never said, jump out of the air and the water onto the land with both feet. Did he? If you do, I guarantee what will happen to you is the wave will come crashing down upon you and you'll run out of breath and drown. You try and get out of the water and you try and not believe in the air and the trusts that are held. Everything is a trust. The air is the, above the land, which is above the water. It's the highest form of law, trust law. All nations are formed in trust. Look up the law of nations by Battelle. It's our oldest legal documents. Long before we came on these shores. It's how nations are created under trust. The name of the trust of this nation is the Public Charitable Trust. That's the name of the trust. Our nation has been under it for a very, very long time. Public charitable trust. Trust law, all things held in trust. The Bible is a trust indenture. It's two of them. God's the executor. He created all things. 
He commanded me, mankind, to take dominion, he made me the trustee. And then he went into the begats. Who begat whom, and who begat who, and who begat who, and who. Hardest part of the Bible to get through, <laughs> right? Anybody ever read it all? Oh, yeah, me too. Boy. Whew. And it says uh, on forever. They're the beneficiaries. Goes on forever. That's a trust. And then the rest of the Old Testament teaches you how to keep the trust. How to administer the trust. And then that book closed and the new book opened and everything under Christ was a new trust indenture. And you know what he did for you in that new trust indenture? He paid off all your debt. All of it. And you volunteer to be debtors again thereby committing sin. Are you a debtor or a creditor? That's right. You're the creditor. How are you, how did you become the creditor of this nation? They registered your birth. They bonded it, they insured it, they created the vessel, they handed you a shipping company to operate. They just didn't teach you how. And then you volunteered to be the purser on the ship, the person. That purser position is an office of you hold office on that ship as the signatory officer. The purser is always the signatory officer of every ship. Every airplane has a purser. Every ship has a purser. Everything's about transportation and shipping in commerce. And you're the signatory. And the purser's job is to pay the taxes and port charges and docking fees and resupply the ship. You're responsible for all the supplies of the ship. And you can make any deal you want. And if you make a bad deal and you put the wrong cargo on the ship, you can be held in debtor's prison. as the purser and all statue is written for the person. And what does God say about that in the Bible? In Job 32, 21 and 22, he says, be the man and not the person. Don't put flattering titles of person upon the man for if you do, it's a sin and he'll surely take you away. And we go through our life being taught to be the purser, the citizen. And the resident. And then we weren't taught what the words meant. And we just keep check marking boxes. Volunteering, consenting. Government operates through the consent of the governed. You ever heard that statement? Government operates through the consent of the governed. City is municipal. Zen is servant. Now you're a municipal servant. What is that? A public servant. Now you're an employee of government. You're serving on the office of purser or person, which is the signatory officer responsible for all the taxes and bills and lading and fees as the debtor. 
and you're claiming to be a resident, and the legal definition of resident is someone there temporarily to do business. That's its definition. Someone there temporarily to do business. You live in a residential house. That's a commercial term. Industrial, commercial, and residential are all commercial terms. What happened to the words private property? See, I live on private property. It's held in land patent. Tops of the fence posts are painted purple. It has to stay the hell, I mean, no trespassing steins. <laughs> See, and they can't come on my property. If they do, they better bring ID so we can notify their next to kin. <laughs> Citizen, person, resident. Three things you don't ever want to be. If you do, you need CPR because you're dead and somebody needs to bring you back to the land of the living. That's what we do as state nationals. So what is this thing, American state national? What is it? What continent is this? It's America. Are you kidding? It's really Turtle Island. It is. That goes back long before the word America. Turtle Island. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Ask our Native American brothers, sisters. America, united as a continent. State. I don't know about you, but I'm a Texian now. This is where I choose to inhabit. Where I choose. Hmm? Take your pick. You do. You gotta have somewhere you can call home. Take your pick. So what does national mean? What does state nation mean? Every state is a nation. Texas is as different from Oklahoma as Italy is to England. But if England and Italy and France unite, well, then they're no different than Texas, Oklahoma, and Missouri. But they're independent nation states. Pick one. See, it's the people of the state that started government. They created government. They're the creators. We never gave government the power to create anything. We never gave them that power. They can't create anything. Only the people can create. You gotta understand yourself. You gotta understand the power that you have. Every state constitution says the same thing in either Article 1, Section 1, or Article 1, Section 2. It might say in a little bit different wording, but it says the same thing. I'm going to read you Oregon's. Natural rights are inherent in the people. We declare that all men, when they form a social compact, are equal in right. 
that all power is inherent in the people. All power is inherent in the people. And all free governments are founded on their authority, the people's authority, and instituted for their peace, safety, and happiness. When was the last time a police officer put his blue lights on, pulled you over in your car, walked up to your window and said, how can I help you in your peace, safety, and happiness? I never stopped that. And they have at all times a right to alter, reform, or abolish the government in any such manner as they may think proper and expedient proper and expedient. What does that mean? That means we can get together and we can assemble. Oh my gosh, we got an assembly right here. And we assemble. And we can talk about it. And we can make change. And there's many ways to change government. Many, many ways to change government. I want you to understand, once you understand who you are, you need to understand who government is. Who is government? It's you. All government is inherent in the people. You are government. Sure is not some private for-profit corporation acting and pretending to be government under color of law. You see, what they do is they get Taco Bell to serve a warrant on Burger King and go arrest McDonald's. That's all they do. They deal with corporations. And what is your all caps name? It's a shipping company. And that's the name of your corporation. And you get a presentment in the mail and it's got your all caps name on because it come from some government agency office. It's addressed to your shipping company and you treat it personal. It's not. You got to understand that you're the controlling officer. You're the signatory. You're the debtor. Because you don't own the ship. But what if you could own the ship? What if you could make the claim to own the ship and all the securities and assets of the shipping company? What if you could do that? What if you could get a $900 utility bill in the mail? And I'm talking about Texas down here now. Our power is cheap in Oregon. All those dams, all those rivers, they produce so much power up there. Oregon, Oregon powers California. I just want you to know that. Windmills. <laughs> it costs more to produce that windmill than they'll ever make back. I, I got a great picture sent to me the day before yesterday. It was a electric car charging station. <laughs> and right behind it was a great big diesel generator running to make the electricity to charge the car. I mean a great big one. 20,000 kilowatt hour generator to run the charging stations with electric cars parked at them. Are you kidding me? You think those electric cars 
It costs more money in diesel in the mining equipment to mine the lithium for the stupid battery pack in that than they'll ever save in fuel. It's a way to burn extra diesel. Just go produce a whole bunch of electric cars. It just shifts who's using the diesel. Understand that. God, people. Sometimes you got to think outside the box. Be a little creative. You'll learn something. Yeah, I know Teslas are nice. Shh. No, they're not. We got a Buick and it's nice. <laughs> And who might that be? Tesla. Well, let me tell you something about that. He's on our side. <clears throat> anyway, I want you guys to make the United States code your friend. I know that sounds stupid. I spend half my life teaching you the rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law. They're corporate bylaws. They're for employees of the corporation to follow. And then I tell you to make the United States code your friend. Sounds kind of dumb. It's not, though. See, the United States Code was put into place for one reason and one reason only. And that's for you, as a people, to hold your public servants accountable. That's why it's there. And it's the only code based upon the people's law. And it'll tell you what's law in that code and what isn't law in that code. And that's a beautiful thing as well. You've got to understand there are three types of law. Superior law is God's law and nature's law. God's law and nature's law. Superior law. Supreme laws are constitutions and our treaties. I like to use this example, and this is a good thing to draw as a teaching thing for your kids. You just draw yourself a brick wall. The Bible is superior law. It's at the top of the wall. Your Declaration of Independence, your Constitution, your Articles of Confederation. And I should have put another one down here, or split that one in two is the ordinance of 1787, better known as the Northwest Ordinance. The foundation is actually your state law constitutions and treaties. That's your foundation, your state constitutions and treaties. The Ordinance of 1787, the Articles of Confederation, the first constitution, first one. Where do I get this from? First constitution. 
the preface of the United States Code says all, well, first it says this nation was founded upon Christian principles, i.e. the Bible. And the Bible is law. It's public law 97-280. That's where it's codified. The Bible is law. And then it goes on to say that all law shall be based upon Sorry about that. Speakers and mics. All laws of the United States shall be based upon the Bible and these four founding documents. All laws of the United States shall be based upon the Bible and these four founding documents. New people who held up their hands said they were new. What are the four founding documents? Come on, you went to 13 years of school, didn't you, minimum? Isn't that sad? Declaration of Independence. The first Constitution. the Articles of Confederation, and the Ordinance of 1787, better known as the Northwest Ordinance. All laws of the United States shall be based upon the Bible and those four founding documents. What happens if they're not? They're void. They're null and void. If they don't meet the standards set forth, they're in, they're null and void. See, that's what gives us freedom in this country. But the best slaves are the ones that believe they were free. The ones that believe they were free are the best slaves. And then there's corporate bylaws. The Supreme Court of the United States says that rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law. They're corporate bylaws, and they're for employees of the corporation to follow. Well, wait a minute. Didn't they tell you you had to drive 55? Wear that seatbelt. Don't talk on your cell phone. Oh, wait, you got to get a license to go hunting and fishing to feed your family. See, all these rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law. They're for corporate employees. And then you came along and believed you were a corporate employee, a municipal servant, holding office of purser as a resident. And then you used your zip code, putting you in a federal district. So there's 335 million citizens in the United States who live and reside. They live in Washington, D.C. and reside in Texas temporarily to do business by their own consent the consent of the governed. <laughs> oh, look at things like the Clearfield Doctrine. Government took away all your money. All of it. They took away your gold and your silver and your money. In 1935, I have posters from 1935 telling everybody to turn in all their gold and silver or they would be fined $10,000. They had to turn in all their gold and silver. My grandfather came from California. 
and he was he was a miner. That's the family he grew up in. Another one of my grandfathers died in a mining accident. He was buried in Denver, Colorado. Died in the Black Hawk Mine. Black Hawk's now kind of a famous little city. Go on mining tours down there. He died in one of those mines. And he's buried in Denver. My other grandfather was a geologist for the state of California, and he had been a miner for years. And he became a geologist. And in 1935, he turned it over at $20 an ounce, over $1 million worth of gold into the federal government. A piece of paper that they never made good on. A promissory note that they never made good on. Now, I don't know about you, but if he was my grandfather and I'm the son, grandson, that was my inheritance. And it's $2,000 an ounce now. How much they owe me? I don't know, but it was um, over a million dollars worth at $20 an ounce. I say they owe me a chunk of change. See? This is the unbreakable wall, you guys. When rules, codes, statutes, ordinances, executive orders, don't tell me that, just make me cry. Executive orders, Rules, codes, statutes, ordinances, executive orders come up against this wall and they don't meet the standards set forth in those documents, then they fall. And the law is null and void. It doesn't just say it's voidable, it says it's void. And there's another Supreme Court case that says it's void and we can ignore it with impunity. Any game wardens in the room? What about subsistence hunting? What about subsistence fishing? Now, if you're going to go catch a bunch of fish and go sell them to your neighbors, that's commerce. That's different. Go get a license. But if you're going to go fishing, you're going to catch a couple of fish, take them home, feed your family. You don't need a stinking license to do it. You've got to understand this. You've got to understand this. Well, I haven't got much into my book today, but I'm going to. And by the way, for those that can see it, that's the shape of Texas. See, this was created by treaty, by Suprema. After men spilt their blood in battle. And it was a treaty. And this goes clear up through Colorado into Wyoming. Touches three counties in Wyoming. It goes clear to the river running through the middle of Albuquerque. On the other side of the river was Arizona. Or to get permission to create New Mexico. New Mexico. Where they where they get permission to create it? They took it out of Texas and they took it out of Arizona. What if you were a proud Texian that had just got back from the Battle of Gilead, shed your blood, washed your, your friends die, 
and you were living east of the river and no one said, where's your vote to become New Mexico? And they just showed up one day at your door, knocked on the door and you open it and some government agent, he says, hey, here's your new address. You live in New Mexico. How would you feel? That's what they did to you. During the reconstruction era, a couple of people in Washington, D.C. divided up the states and redid borders. And most of those came with two signatures who signed off on it. And no one got your permission. And it didn't go through an act of Congress. The entire state of Nevada was taken out of Arizona. That was Nevada County of Arizona. And I've got the paperwork on it, on my iPad. And there's two signatures of people sitting in Washington, D.C., signed off on creating the state of Nevada. What if you were a proud Arizonan living in that county and they didn't ask for your vote and they just created it one day? How would you feel? There were 31, ter 31 republics and they created 48 states out of them. Should have seen Oregon. Man, it covered Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and three counties in Wyoming. That are Oregon territory. Why is there two universities like Oregon State University and the University of Oregon? Because the University of Oregon was formed before the state of Oregon. And the University of Oregon was formed after. Oregon State University. It was spelled, if you go look at the building, look at the carving, it was spelled Oregon with a small letter state. Oregon State. It's located in Corvallis, Oregon. It's the Beavers. Oregon State Beavers. That university was there before Oregon became a state of corporation. And so the state of had to have one. And now what? The state of and Oregon State are rivals, and it's the beavers and the ducks fighting against each other, and it's the Republic of Oregon and the state of Oregon fighting against each other, because that's what those schools represent. And a lot of states have that. Check out when they were formed and you'll start to see a little bit of a pattern. Yeah, it's patterns, gotta watch for. You'll see one was formed right before it became a state and the other one right after in a lot of states. I find that very interesting. Republic of Texas. You know, Bobby, uh, Bobby told me something one time, and I just, I just love the way he said it. I'd kind of like to get him up here and say it again for you, if I can pick on him a minute. 
but our our founding fathers our founding fathers created this nation and in the very first article they put things in a certain order for a reason and I want Bobby to tell you that Let's talk about the first amendment right on right on Bring me just a little bit volume up on this mic, if you would. So these, these things we call our, our founding parchments. I call them parchments. Yeah. They're ours, and they were bequeathed to us at a great cost. And as I started studying about this all along about 20, 2017, actually, I started studying about this, our nation's founding and what is freedom versus liberty. So I started a deep dive on learning about these parchments, these thing called the Declaration of Independence and this thing called our Constitution and what all that means. And, you know, like David says, it's important to comprehend who and what you are because everything you do comes from who and what you are. If you don't know who and what you are, you don't have any standing to make any claims. And the founders told us something in the Declaration of Independence, and those words go a little something like this. This is the chiefest event, one of the things that are first in law, and these are the words that are yours. And they go a little something like this. Don't let anyone ever tell you that this nation was not founded on godly principles. And those words are like this. It says, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them to one another and assume among themselves a separate and equal station that the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. That is the first sentence of the first law of our nation. And it's listed in the United States Code under organic matters. Now, under a maxim of law, <clears throat> it's the Mac Daddy maxim of law. You know what a maxim of law is? A maxim of law is an ultimate truth that is timeless. It cannot be argued with. It's something you can stand on that no judge, no administrator, no executor de Santort, no fraudster bar attorney can ignore. It is a settled matter of fact, of ultimate truth. And the Mac Daddy maxim of law is the chiefest event, the strongest. And that goes a little bit like this. It says what is first in law is strongest in law. And that's the first sentence of the founding of our nation, and it is yours. So when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them to one another and assume among themselves a separate and equal station that the laws of nation, nature and nature's God entitle them. That's very, very powerful. And that those, those first, how much time I got? Okay, do it fast. Okay, so we have a rule book. We have an instruction book, and it's called the First Amendment. The First Amendment and then the Second Amendment, all right? The Second Amendment is the second for a reason. The First Amendment has five freedoms in it, things that government cannot take from us, and they're in a specific order for a specific reason. You know, these, these founding, the founding generation, they were... Brilliant men. They were study. They were. They were. They studied history. And and they studied people. And the, the first amendment has these five freedoms, and they're in a specific order for a specific reason because they work forwards and backwards. The first freedom is what government shall make no law abridging the right of the people to practice what. I can't spell. Religion. And then the second one was what? It's okay. I didn't know them either. And the third one is what? 
The press. And the fourth one is what? A-S-S-E-M-B-L-E. And the fifth one has actually three things. We can do a petition of grievances for, this is important, for redress. A petition for redress of grievance. Now, <clears throat> we meet, and religion is the first one. Why? Because when we, when we meet, we usually go to church, or we come together, and we talk about things that are right and wrong. We have a common sense of what's right and wrong, a good moral compass. And we do that as people. And we, we meet, and what happens after we, after we get done in church? We start talking about events of the day, when in the course of human events. And after we talk about them, we write them down. And we post them, and we, we find out if it's happening in the other province at the time of our nation's founding. Today we call them counties. So it works forwards and backwards. We learn about what's right and wrong. We talk about them, and we write them down to find out if they're happening everywhere else. And when they are, we peacefully assemble as men and women. And at this peaceful assembly, we write a petition, which is basically translates, if you really dig down, it's a paternal, the parent, the one that created. A petition of grievances. What's wrong? Sean Hannity is a hammer. He loves to hammer grievances all day long, three hours a day and an hour every night. And let's, how many of you know what's wrong with our country and talk about it a lot? and are fed up talking about it, want to do something about it. I think that's why we're all here, right? We are going to fix this country. Nothing's going to stop what's coming. So we assemble, and this petition writes these grievances down for redress. It doesn't mean distress. It doesn't mean we want their opinion. It means they're going to fix it, and they're going to fix it now. And the Supreme Court says multiple times that we can repair our government in the most expedient and efficient, efficient way possible. That means we give them 14 days or we replace them because all power is inherent in the people. So this works forward and backwards. You see how the, the press, the speech, we talk about what was wrong, what we know is right and wrong. The press, we write it down. We assemble the petition of grievances for redress. And then the Second Amendment kicks in what? When you go to serve the petition through your elected law enforcement, you serve the petition on one of the three branches of government that's misbehaving, and the, sher the sheriff, the Shire Riff, the one that settles the Shire Riff, became the sheriff. That's where the word sheriff comes from. Bill Bill Baggins lived in the Shire, and there was a riff between two people. The one that went and settled the Shire Riff was called the sheriff. So the sheriff goes to serve it on the governor of your state, and they have capital police, and they say, oh, no, no, go away with your 20 deputies. There's 100 of us. He goes, the sheriff goes back to the assembly and says, hey, guess what? I can't serve that petition. Then the guy who the speaker of the assembly calls up, there's two over here. There's one and two, a militia and arms. And they meet regularly. That means reg they're well regulated. That means they meet regularly. It doesn't mean government gets to regulate them. Then the Speaker of the Assembly calls up whoever's running the militia to bear their arms and peacefully, don't point them, peacefully support the sheriff in doing the will of the people. So it works forwards and backwards. When the petition fails, they go back to the assembly. When the assembly fails to talk about, to, to, it goes backwards and forwards. Can you all see that? It works forward. This is beautiful. This is part of a bigger presentation I do that's about an hour long. And boy, I'm not going to take that kind of time. But when we start to comprehend how we use the parchments, and there are four of them, with, dot, with papers that came before that, like the Magna Carta and so many other things, we learn that we have to become the conductor of the orchestra of freedom. 
And every paper, every parchment, everything that has been settled through international treaty and international agreements and international law, we use those to repair our government and put them back in the box that we the people created. Thank you very much. Bobby's like John Adams, man. I wish I had that big booming voice. I got to just about scream at you for three days to get you to hear it. And he he just he just shakes the walls. <clears throat> so I was just glancing at my book over there. I should be following it a little more closely. I've got so much meat and potatoes for you in that book. I mean, I, I we can prove everything that we talk about. Article 11 of the Articles of Confederation. Canada is ceding to this confederation and joining in the measures of the United States shall be admitted into and entitled to all the advantages of this union. What do you think about that? Why are we? Are we? Are we really? Just because Castro's son's up there screwing things up for him doesn't mean that we're separate. And it only took nine states in agreement is what it goes on to say. Nine states in agreement. And they... It's uh, Article 11 of the Articles of Confederation. Okay. Title 28 of the United States Code, Section 3002.5, Chapter 176. All you got to do is read that, and you will know there is no doubt that the federal government is a private corporation. Title 28, Section 3002, 5, Chapter 176. Now, I absolutely forgot earlier when I was talking about what happened in September because I was a little distracted by a pretty blonde that wanted to pray. One other thing that happened that was big, or as President Trump would say, huge, right? BlackRock filed for bankruptcy. BlackRock and Vanguard filed for bankruptcy. Vanguard. Vanguard was their investment arm of BlackRock. The state of Louisiana alone pulled hundreds of millions of dollars worth of contracts. 786 million. I wasn't going to say the exact number. Numbers don't matter much to me. It's the concept. <laughs> they pulled a lot of money away from BlackRock in their contracts. And that helped them go bankrupt. It wasn't the only thing. A lot of stuff happened. Their mortgage fraud nationwide. Their computer system. BlackRock had a computer system that was basically AI. And uh, it generated a growth rate in profits that was beyond what we should ever do or what any company should do. And it took advantage of millions, hundreds of millions of people. And it stole a lot of people's properties. And uh, two weeks ago, you might have heard about a little police action in New York City. 
Lots of police and military went to the Black Rock building and removed all their servers. There's more that's going to come out of this story. It's going to be interesting. Well, I mean, if that's essentially real, the market's going to crash. That's all that's left. It's an L. That's it. The market will crash. The market has to crash. The market crashing may injure some people, but it's a good thing. It really is. It's going to have to crash. The fiat currency that people carry around in their wallets, that's got to end. <clears throat> this stuff, Federal Reserve Note, it's a note. What is a note? It is a debt. This is a debtor's note. It's not real money and it never discharges a debt. It tenders it to a later date, to probate. All debts are settled in probate. You've got to understand how this works. They never discharged a debt in your entire life using this. It just tendered it to a later date. I want you to see how they've been transitioning our bills. I don't have a hundred. I don't. I didn't have a hundred in my wallet. You got a hundred in your wallet? Somebody's got one. I'm sure. Oh, I spent it over there. They got it. <laughs> you already bought a hundred dollars worth of t-shirts? No. I'll just use Bob. <clears throat> he knows I'll give it back to him. That's the one. This was a transition dollar. Okay. I want you to understand it. It was the first one. This is also a transition dollar. I want you to know what this means. On any piece of paper is a balance sheet. You divide the paper in the middle, it's debits and credits. That's the debtor side of the paper. It's got the signatures on it. It says on that side of the bill, Federal Reserve Note, legal tender on that side of the bill. It does not say that on this side of the bill. In fact, on this side of the bill, it says dollars. And it's, the hundred is printed in gold. It also has the inkwell with the gold Liberty Bell and the gold quill pen and the gold writing. And if you look, read that writing under a magnifying glass, you will see that it's transitioning back to real money. On the creditor side of the paper on the back is the same way. Uh, gold 100. On the debtor side, it's black. Okay. The transition line, the strip, transition line. When this bill started coming out in 2009, it was 50% backed by gold. They were about to lose all that gold in 2001. So they brought down a few buildings in New York to recover the gold. Oh, they lost it in a lawsuit. You can look up the lawsuit. It was going back to the original owner of the gold. This nation was going to lose all that gold. China. And so they had to get the gold out because they lost a lawsuit. You got to understand what really happened, what really went on. No airplane took down a building. Those tin cans crumble and crush when they hit something, just like a soda can would. Every engineering firm 
in the world knows that. Okay? It's been proven. Thermal pyrite happens to do a very good job, though, when it cuts steel beams. Okay? But this was transition dollars, so is this. Notice the gold 50 in the corner on the creditor side, right? Now you want to say the other part of it? The back of the bill is the people's bill. It's the people's credit. It says United States of America. And an agent at the Treasury recently told us that as a state national, we're supposed to put we're supposed to put it down this side up. and it's supposed to discharge a debt. And it's a keystroke between a dollar sign with one line or two. That's gonna get loud. The dollar bill is the one that says. Yeah, it doesn't matter, they're, yeah, bo they're right, both right. the same. Right, right, yep. Exactly. Now they're all the same. They are, yep. The backsides of all of them. On the front side, it talks about the corporation. On the back side, it talks about the real nation. Very, hey, you could have took this one back with you. Right. Yeah, we've been transitioning for quite a while. The new currency is already printed. That is the ones. What's that? Our new currency, that's what I'm gonna call it. It's already printed, it's in every armored car warehouse in the country, ready for the day that the order's given to exchange it for the fiat currency. And it's all, everything will be backed by gold. It's gold and silver backed digital certificates. And yes, there will be a cryptocurrency, and the paper money's not going to go away either. But there will be a variety of money, all backed by gold-backed digital certificate. What does that mean? I want to explain what that means. I think we can turn the heat off, though. I'm already feeling the heat coming from that thing. You guys cold? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. I want you to understand how money works. And this is very important. This goes back a very, very long, long time. to King Solomon, the son of King David. And Solomon was blessed and he inherited all the riches of the world, all the gold, all the silver, and all the riches of the world. He inherited from God to be the trustee for the benefit of the people. It's people's money. And the reason a miner like Parker Schnabel up in the Yukon has to get a mining permit is so that when he digs millions of cubic yards of earth to get a few thousand ounces of gold, he has to report how much gold he took out of the ground. because it's already owned by King Solomon's heirs. 
than it always has been. And you can take, eventually, that gold ends up in big bricks, eventually. Some of it's used on people's fingers for a long time and goes back into the earth when you're buried. But eventually, all the gold and silver in the world is owned by King Solomon's heirs. And that went down through history, and I'm going to skip a whole lot of generations, and it went to Caesar. And I'm not even going to spell that all out, because I'll screw it up. It went to Caesar, and then it went to two kings, and was split to two cousins for the first time, King John and King Ferdinand. Now, England was being attacked. See, your English history has been just gently squeezed and turned. And people didn't realize that during those periods of time, England was being attacked by everybody. And so King John took the majority of the gold. And he spent that on dividing England into territories, building castles, installing knights, building armies to defend England. And then King Ferdinand got enough gold to build the world's largest shipping company. Spain had more ships than any other nation in the world. And they did that so that they could go gather up the rest of the inheritance. And the Spain went all over the world to gather all the gold and bring it back to Spain from all the miners of King Solomon from all over the world. The Aztecs, the Incas, the Maoris, the Guineas, the Filipinos. What does the word Filipino mean? First people. The Maharakan tribe, they can trace it all the way back through Seth to Adam. Okay? They're not the only ones, but they can trace it. And eventually this got divided up. Now there's a little phenomenon that has happened in America since 1776, is that every president we have ever had traces their lineage to King John or King Ferdinand, without exception, even Obama through his mother's side of the family. All of them. Two traced to, directly to Ferdinand, all the rest to King John, except for two that traced to both. So you really think you've ever voted for a president? You might as well go out and buy one of those uh, billion dollar jackpot lottery tickets and expect to win. <laughs> Never have. Yes, even Biden. Now, that is broke down to where there's 13 families. And in each of those families, some of them have separate factions of their family. Or one side of the family doesn't like the other or doesn't talk to the other. We're trying to get them all to talk. It's kind of cool. Because they've all agreed that they are just the trustees. 
And in the last days, according to scripture, they all get together and they create something for the benefit of every man, woman, and child on the planet. And guess what they have? And it's coming. See, you can take every gold brick there is and you can turn it over. And on the underneath side of that brick is a account number with the World Bank and a king's seal of one of the 13 families. So we know every brick of gold in the world who owns it, who the trustee is. And they left, those families left the gold with trust companies to manage the storage of it. And there's just a handful of trust companies that manage all the gold and silver stored in the world. And those trust companies are supposed to be paid 4% interest on average on the gold. And they use armies of the world to guard the gold and silver. And that gold and silver is held in various places around the world to protect it in case disaster happens. And wherever it's held, it's guarded by armies. Our military, the Swiss Guard, MI6, Philippine Army, they all guard it. And they guard that gold for the trust companies. The number on the back of the gold correlates with the World Bank account that is considered a spiritual account that holds the currency, the asset in the warehouse. The asset in the warehouse. I want you to understand how this works. Gold and silver is heavy. It's hard to move around. So that gold and silver is the asset in the warehouse managed by a trust company. We'll call it an escrow company making 4% interest. I know what you want to do. You want to take a lunch break? I hear their tummies grumbling. Okay. I can hear it. I'm going to quit right after this. The 13 families own it and control it, but they don't manage it. The trust companies do. The families have now agreed gold-backed digital certificates and the release of the spiritual accounts. But the management fee has to be paid to the trust companies. When that happens, you're going to see a big change, a big change in everything. And life as we know, it's going to change. And it'll issue in a thousand years of peace as part of it. But only when the time is right. When is the time right? When the people are ready, then who returns? Christ returns. And when does that happen? After the time of tribulation, which happened right after the time of the Great Awakening. And the Great Awakening started September 23rd, 2017. And it was to last 2,000 days, which would have put it sometime on the Gregorian calendar into March, around the 18th of 2023. However, God said, no one will know the time and the place, and that in the end days he will speed things up, and you have to watch for the signs. 
And the signs have already happened. They happened in June of this year. How many fish were in the net? 153 large fish. In Hebrew, 153 is the 15th day of the third month of God's calendar. April's the alpha month, month one, the beginning of the new year, the spring, when babies are born. God's calendar has 13 months of 28 days. 13 times 28 is 364 with one neutral day. And uh, this year, that occurred on April the 4th on the Gregorian calendar. See, we know the Gregorian calendar was just SMU. It was all shit made up, and it contained a bunch of holidays that were all pagan rituals. God's calendar is this. A woman's cycle is every 28 days. A cycle of the moon is every 28 days. Babies are born in the spring. The end of the year was never supposed to fall in the middle of winter. It's when new life begins. April. See, I want you to know this. April is one. May is two. June is three. June is the third month. And on the 15th day of June, according to this calendar, at exactly 5.31 a.m., over the city of Jerusalem, all the planets lined up with the sun, signaling the end of the great of the great awakening with Cetus at the fish because the dragon consumes the fish. And Cetus is the dragon. Don't blame me? Well let's look at it this way. Sept is seven oct is eight, Nov is nine, Dec is a decade, 10, Jan is 11, Feb is 12. How come December's our 12th month? It's really the 10th month. So your whole calendar's been off for a long time. You're, most people worship on the wrong day. The Sabbath starts tonight at dark, and it ends at dark tomorrow night. When did that change? Changed in 321 AD with Constantine. He wanted to bring the pagans into the Christian world. So they would fast on Saturday and feast on Sunday, and everybody liked to feast more than a fast. Who doesn't, right? I like to eat too. Everybody liked to feast more than fast. So they started worshiping on the Sunday, because that's what the pagans worship, the God of the sun and it brought paganism into Christianity, and they changed the day of your worship. And in the last days, they will make you force worship on Sunday. Yeah. So start thinking about some of these things. And how do they relate to your life, and how do you change it? And then go home and read Deuteronomy 28 
And you do, and you'll watch your life get better if you just do that one thing. I'm not going to tell you what it is. My wife's not going to tell you what it is. She's over there hollering at me right now. Deuteronomy 28, do that one thing and watch your life get better. Go have lunch. And uh, how long are we taking? One hour. There are food trucks outside, so you don't have to go very far. Please put a jacket on. It is a little chilly since uh, we've had the cold front move in. <laughs>